Welcome to our webinar. We already have almost 50 participants with us and I think a few are still coming in. I would quickly like to say welcome and hello. My name is Magdalena. I work for Finanzwende and I co-authored the report uh, Shrink Finance for Prosperity that we would like to present today and discuss uh, with our panelists and our, our uh, our audience here. Um, the report is part of the Transformative Responses Project, a joint project by Finanzwende and the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And um, we are very happy to have uh, Nick Jackson with us today as a moderator. Nick is an expert in the field himself. He has written a book called The Finance Curse on the Oversized Financial Sector in the UK. And uh, well, yeah, Nick, thank you for, for being here today, for facilitating the debate um, and also for your support throughout uh, the process of writing this report, which was very helpful. And I just have one technical announcement before we start. We will uh, later on also take questions from the audience into the debate and you can put them into the Q&A box or it's an F&A in this case. Uh, we will collect them and then feed them into the debate. Well, yeah, and now uh, I can only wish you uh, an interesting debate and uh, over to, to Nick. Sorry, sorry, unmute. Thanks very much. Um, great to be part of this debate. Uh, I'm just gonna give a brief introduction. I actually came into this, uh, I started coming to this many years ago. I was a war correspondent in Angola in Africa, I lived there for a couple of years, and I was a, had a sort of frontline view of what scholars came to call the resource curse, uh, which is um, one version of it is that uh, countries that produce minerals like oil um, don't develop uh, because the money gets squandered and stolen and all that kind of stuff. But there's a stronger version of the resource curse, which is that um, uh, some countries that produce uh, resources like oil, and Angola, in my opinion, was one of those countries at the time, are actively harmed. They, they have lower economic growth. There's a kind of paradox there. More riches, more wealth coming into the country actually makes the country poorer. Um, now, I then started looking at the world of tax havens, and I began to realise uh, that financial centers in countries can get too big. You can have the same kind of paradox of plenty where too much finance um, can actually make you poorer. And that's the kind of central concept in, in this report. Um, uh, I wrote a book called The Finance Curse, which kind of looked at this. It focused quite heavily on the UK, and mostly I've been looking at the UK and British. Um, I'm going to just start with three kind of concepts to think about, food for thought, you might call it. Um, the first one is a fried egg. Imagine a fried egg. Um, there's a yolk at the center and a, a white bit on the outside. This is uh, one way of looking at the financial sector. We all need a financial sector. It provides many useful services that we all know and use and love. Um, that is the yolk at the center, the useful core. Um, however, there are many parts of the financial sector, particularly more recently, um, which are actively harmful. They are extractive, they are dangerous, they are risky. Um, and that is the white outside of the fried, fried egg. And of course, the boundary before the, between them is fuzzy and it's um, you can debate about what's harmful and what's not. But I think it's pretty uncontroversial that there is a useful part to finance and there is a harmful part of finance. And Ideally, we would shrink the harmful part and keep the useful part. So that's the first food for thought. The second food for thought is a banana. Um, this is a graph that there are many academic studies which are basically an, an inverted U shape, which uh, is an upside down banana, where which plots economic growth against levels of financial development. So at early levels of financial development, a country... Um, needs more finance, it needs to develop its financial sector more, that supports the real economy, provides the useful services that the economy needs. But there becomes a kind of um, optimal point at the top of the banana graph um, where finance is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And if you keep expanding the financial sector beyond that optimal point, and there's lots and lots of research from the IMF, from the Bank for International Settlements and, and various academic studies showing the same basic relationship. Countries that go too far to the right where the financial sector grows too large actually suffer lower growth. Again, there's this kind of paradox of too much finance makes you poorer. 
or his apparent paradox. And the third quick graph, which um, this report uh, uh, touches on, is a pie or a pizza. Uh, and this is like a pie, this is a pie chart that I'm talking about, and it's looking at what finance is doing, um, how wh where is uh, finance expending its energies, and in general terms, in the UK that I know best, but also um, in Europe, it's it turns out that finance is uh, banking, the banking system is financing itself, the large degree, more than 70% of what um, of, of bank lending is going back into the financial sector, and a, a, a relatively small minority of their lending is going into what you might call the real economy. So those are my three images to start with, um, conceptual images, the, the um, fried egg, the banana, and the pie or the, or, or the pizza. Um, so I'm going to hand over now to Magda, who's now going to introduce the report. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll have some discussion later. Thanks, Nick. And um, I quickly tried to share my screen with you now, one second. Now you should see a presentation, right? That's excellent. Um, yeah, so to, to tell a bit the story of our report and give you a brief overview of all the things we've written there. We, the title of our report is Shrink Finance for Prosperity. And the basic observation we're starting from is the one that you can see in this graph. The financial sector has grown a lot in the last decades. And when we look here at financial assets relative to GDP in the Eurozone, then we see within the last 20 years, it has doubled. And this is not only a development in the last 20 years, but it, it's, it dates back to the period of financial deregulation in the 1970s. And uh, from this observation, we basically go all the way to the conclusion that Nick uh, mentioned here before. Can I quickly interrupt, Magda? Yeah. Um, some of us can't see the graph. I don't know if that's um, if everybody's having that problem. Uh, the, well, can you see uh, the, the shared screen with the presentation? Yeah, so you can see the first page of the Shrink Finance for Prosperity. Ah, sorry, yeah, that's my... That's interesting. Somehow it only shows... Huh. Thanks for the hint. I'll try to fix that. That's curious. Let me try again. Do you see the presentation now? See the, we can see the start of the presentation. Yeah, and now you see the first slide. Yes, now I can oh, see it. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so, well, here's the slide I was talking about <laughs> with uh, the massive increase of financial assets relative to economic output. And the, the core message of our report is, and this is what Nick has already mentioned in his introduction, more finance doesn't necessarily lead to more prosperity. In fact, it is the contrary. And since today's financial sector in Europe and especially in Germany is largely focused on harmful activities and it also leads to crisis and rising inequality. And in order to structure our, our findings, we looked into four different dimensions of the oversized financial sector we started out with uh, the self-serving nature of finance and we continued with how finance affects uh, stability. We went on to, to look into the practices where finance actually extracts wealth from the economy and from households. And in the end, we, we finished with a chapter where we look how finance actually circumvents regulation with a large part of its activities. Yeah, so to start with, um, we, we looked at banks and we started from the textbook uh, definition, banks provide credit and that's their main purpose. But when we look at data on their balance sheets, we found out that, well, only 
of their balance sheets are used to for, for lending to households and non-financial firms. And we were wondering like 30%, what are they doing with the rest? And in fact, the the the, the main the main answer to this question is there are uh, there's a big share of intra sector activities so basically finance dealing with finance and for a large part these activities have no benefit for society and they can be extractive or destabilizing and we then went further to look at one actor in particular we we looked into the annual reports of deutsche bank and we found in 2020 deutsche bank provided credit to the real economy in a volume of 3% of German GDP. And then if you flip a few pages, you find Deutsche Bank's derivatives uh, activities and its exposure of its derivative activities are equal to 1000% of German GDP. And derivatives are often uh, t contracts that, that involve only two financial actors and not the real economy or, or anyone else. So we found this was a very strong hint to finance actually not uh, financing good things, but dealing with itself. And a lot of, a lot, a big part of finance, uh, dealing with finance also takes place between banks and shadow banks. And this uh, leads me to the next dimension we looked at. After the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, the banking sector was regulated more strictly and this led to a shift of very risky activities to so-called shadow banks which are financial actors that, that provide bank-like activities but they are not called banks or not regulated equally to banks and as you can see from the from the graph it shows uh, the financial assets in the euro area that while in 2002 the main holder of uh, financial assets were still banks in 2019 shadow banks ha have grown to to the biggest holder of financial assets and you can also see that the volume of the whole thing has has massively increased and uh, shadow banks are very unstable when when financial markets fluctuate and for instance, at the beginning of the 2019 COVID financial crisis, shadow banks got into trouble and uh, consequently were bailed out by central banks and they profited massively. So to, to, to sum it up here, shadow banks create massive risks. They have little benefit from a societal point of view. And yeah, that's that's quite problematic because we we it, it's also very intransparent and therefore we don't know which uh, risks are still ahead of us but it's not only the size of the sector that's problematic because there are some activities that are directly uh, extracting wealth from other parts of the economy and that's the result of financial deregulation and financial markets gradually taking more influence in society that allowed financial actors to, to dive into these activities. And now you might wonder, how do they extract wealth from the real economy? And there we have a few examples in our report. First example, uh, private equity firms. They uh, invest into private companies they restructure them and they try to make a financial profit and often burden the companies with high debt and for instance also say sell their assets so they have to to lease them back and well another example which we've been working on is uh, it's also in a different uh, finance vendor report it's uh, distribution policies of, of corporations. So basically dividends, bonuses, and share buybacks that, that companies use to distribute their profits. And since the financial sector has grown so powerful, they managed to put pressure on companies to distribute more and more of their profits. 
instead of reinvesting them, for instance. And a study of Oxfam has found that a quarter, almost a quarter of companies in the French index, they even paid more dividends than they made profits in the last decade. And that in, in practical terms, it means that the company is living off its substance, is shrinking itself in order to, to, to give dividends to their shareholders. And these are examples, all of them show how in a way, a powerful financial sector manages to extract profit created somewhere in the economy uh, and, and use it for themselves. Yeah, and then the last uh, dimension we looked at is uh, the circumvention of regulation because we argue that some parts of the financial sector, they exist only to circumvent uh, financial regulation. So for instance, when banks help corporations to lower their tax rate to almost zero, or they run illegal dividend arbitrage schemes, as we've seen a lot in Germany called cum ex and cum cum, or banks even help uh, different actors to, to launder their money. Um, and we argue part of too much finance of a too large financial sector comes from such activities uh, aimed at circumventing regulation that uh, inflate the sector. And um, we argue that this is a part of finance that should basically disappear. So when we say shrink finance, regulate the sector more, we also say circumventing regulation and these activities, dividend arbitrage and tax evasion, that's something that should uh, disappear overall. Yeah, and uh, looking at the whole picture, we thought again, well, after the great financial crisis in 2007 and eight, there was this expectation that now finance should be regulated properly to prevent uh, comparable crises in the future. But this has not happened, at least to a satisfying extent. The financial lobby was super powerful and they, they managed to prevent very good regulatory proposals from being put into practice. And you see here, we listed in the report a even a few more of those proposals that have the potential to, to put the financial sector back at the service of the economy and society. And at the same time, they would have the effect of shrinking the sector. And they have been discussed at length in, in financial regulation uh, debates and also in parliaments, but in the end, none of them were implemented, at least at a satisfying degree. And therefore we wrote them down again in our report and we say we need to re-regulate, shrink and refocus the financial sector to get rid of its illegal and unproductive and harmful activities and to say in the analogy of, of Nick's egg uh, to say we need to shrink away the, the, the white part and keep the York to, to help our society uh, prosper. And I keep it here and now hand over to Nick, who will introduce our two discussants and uh, facilitate the debate. Thanks very much. Yeah. And, and I want to reiterate the idea that finance is a service. Um, to, it, it's a service sector. Um, I am British and I come from a country where there is a widespread view that the financial sector is the engine of the economy somehow. Um, it is not a, it's not seen as a service so much as, as a sort of export sector, something that generates tax revenues and jobs. And this is a, a profoundly dangerous view because um, that leads to all sorts of policies that seek to expand and grow and support finance, often at the expense of other parts of the economy. So um, I'm now going to hand over to Benoit Lallemand um, and Caroline Sissoko. Now, I'm, I'm a believer that, that people should introduce themselves rather than being introduced by someone else. So I'm going to um, hand over, um, first of all, to, to, to Benoit, 
um, to give some reaction to that, and then we'll we'll go to Carolyn. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Nick. Um, I'm very very happy to be here. Can you hear me correctly? Yeah. Am I loud enough? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, so Benoît Allemand, I'm the Secretary General of uh, Finance Watch. We we an NGO which has been created in the aftermath of the financial crisis of. Uh, 2007-2008, um, so created in 2010-2011, um, so already two or three years after the crisis, um, to provide a counterweight to uh, the, the financial lobby uh, in the re-regulation of the financial system post-crisis. And so, so our history, obviously, and, um, and, and we extremely good friends with Finanzwende, who's doing a similar job uh, in Germany. And so, so this history is relevant, I think, to the topic, uh, because in fact, if you remember, in the immediate aftermath of the collapse of Lehman Brothers in uh, say September, October 2008, you had these headlines, including from you know, centrist or conservative uh, newspapers like The Economist, uh, with, with big headlines, you know, is this the end of financialized capitalism? Um, are we reaching, again, the end of fi the financialization of the economy? And all these fundamental issues that, that Mike that just touched upon were on the table, right? So unfortunately, it only took a few months uh, for the financial lobby to, um, to sweep this, this fundamental discussion under the carpet. And by the time you had the G20 summit in Pittsburgh, which really decided on the post-crisis uh, political reaction, if you like, the, the re-regulation agenda, the question of the size of the sector, the nature of the activities, again, had been removed. And uh, the consensus had been created that size and nature are not to be questioned. It's all good, and finance is good in general. Uh, but of course, there's a few rotten apples. There's reckless behavior. This is in the text of the, of the, the Pittsburgh summit. There's uh, irresponsible behavior. And so, you know, basically, we, we need a bit more capital buffers, obviously, for the banks to cover losses. And that's been timidly done. And then we need more supervision. Supervision. So in the US and the EU, you had new supervisory agencies created. Uh, but, but anyway, and we, I, I can talk at length about the, the, this agenda and how it went, but it was extremely disappointing. And, and again, crucially, the big discussion, which is this one, I'm so happy uh, that Finanzwende brings it back, um, is, is the one which we should have had. Um, if, if I may, it's a bit with, like with COVID, you know, when, when COVID hits initially, you had these, these, these big discussions, including by international organizations like the uh, IPDES, but also the World Health Organization, pointing to the root cause of you know, the increased frequency and severity of pandemics at be lying with an extractive uh, production and consumption system and the link with you know, the agribusiness and destroying forests, etc. Um, and then at some point, all that was removed and it was all about the vaccine is going to save us and let's move on. Yeah. Honestly, that's a bit what happened with the financial crisis. And as per the project that you lead, transformative responses, we, sh we, should be, we should be keen that if a next crisis might happen in finance or whatever, or the event, we, we seize the moment and, and avoid that the agenda is, is, uh, is moved to more superficial issues. I just want to, I've almost, exhaust, I've almost exhausted my time. I just want to actually add a few questions to the discussion. I'm surrounded by people uh, much more smarter than me intellectually, so I, I'll leave them to comment. We, we are practitioners of, of financial reg regulation and financial reform. We're still very active. And so just a few, a few more thoughts maybe to the discussion. Um, so first of all, that, the fact that historically, I think financialization, which started in the 80s, was a sort of response or escape from fundamental problems with the economy, right? And, and a fundamental crisis of the, the rate of productivity, et cetera. And in, in a way, financialization was a, an easy political escape from that. And, and as we all know, creating debt, creating um, you know, stocks and inflating stocks uh, uh, valuation is, is all a way to look to the future. And, you know, the, the, these amounts of finance ultimately are a promise of future growth, um, which, uh, which is an escape from the fact that growth is not within the real economy anymore, right? So what do we do about that? And, and we, obviously the, the economy has not improved. And so that problem is still very much there. And, and then just two other points quickly. Um, I think, so there's the overall size, and then in terms of structure, I think there's a the size of financial institutions themselves, right? And I think that's a big problem as well. We've, we've seen a huge concentration. Um, in fact, uh, in 2019, I'll remind you that a certain Olaf Scholz, who was uh, then uh, Ministry of Finance, was very supportive of a merger between Commerzbank and Deutsche Bank. 
because after all, you know, in Europe, we need big champions to compete with the Americans. So um, this is to say that I think it, it's too much finance in general, but, but also I think we, we would very much welcome a return to much more local, including because of the, the transition we need, the just and green transition we need. I think we would need a much more distributed system of very small entities, relationship banking, if you like, with the small projects. Um, and, and that's a bit detached from the, the issue of the, the size overall. And then the, the last point is, I think, are we, you know, public finance versus private finance? So, so in our view, the financial system is, is about three things. It's monetary policy, it's fiscal policy, and then it's private finance. We've seen a big return of fiscal policy, obviously, uh, in reaction to, to COVID. Maybe this is good. I think, again, I'll put monetary policy aside because it would bring us too far. But I think in terms of public finance and, and, and fiscal policy and private finance, I think there's an issue of, uh, I don't know how you say it in English, but, but it, it communicates with each other, right? So, I mean, is it the overall size of finance, including public finance, which is too big? Or is it that because public finance has become taboo and, and was needed to be reduced, again, in Germany, you have fabulous expressions about um, you know, um, how public finance needs to be contained at, at, the, at the strict minimum, that, that then uh, you know, private funds, finance was consciously called to the rescue. And, and today, when we talk about the Paris Agreement or climate objectives, there's an explicit um, there's an explicit political decision by governments to say the financial markets are going to solve this. Of course, we can. That would be that that would be heretic, right? We we cannot. And and again, and I'll finish there. I think public finance inherently is democratic. It has a direction. It's supposed to relate to a project for society that ultimately is held by a political party, which is put in power. And so, fiscal policy is a continuation of that. Again, it is democratic. It's accountable. Uh, it, it has a direction. It, it relates to a vision for society. All things that the private sector doesn't have. So, um, I think if, you know, in the long term, we need to shrink finance. There's no doubt. Uh, and, and by the way, between us, it will shrink because it's it's way too big. And, and you know, these debt to some extent will we, we'll just never be reimbursed. We all know it. And again, these market caps today are at the top. But so, I just wanted to add this this sort of. Uh, bigger perspective to the discussion hopefully we can have in, in a second great thank you thank you very much benoit that was i would love to reflect on those excellent points but i'm in view of time i'm going to pass straight on to carolyn um if you could briefly introduce yourself and and give your reflections thank you so yeah i'm carolyn sasako i'm a senior lecturer at the university of the west of england and i've spent like my entire career essentially studying uh banking central banking and with the financial crisis really got into so what's going on here i ended up going to law school and getting a law degree since this was so regulatory that i thought the only way you could understand it was by understanding the law as well so i come from a perspective of really looking at the history of what uh, of the relationship between finance and growth um, and then you know what's the evolution of regulation right and why did we end up where we are so the, that that's kind of my background and I really want to thank um, uh, finance vendor for uh, this wonderful um, survey very comprehensive very well documented of all the ways that finance is failing us they do an excellent job of emphasizing the fact that we really need to redirect finance into growth enhancing activities and you know uh, get it away from exploiting the vulnerable and that's what shrinking finance is really about it's about like making finance do what it's supposed to do right as opposed to um kind of essentially be a way of uh, generating wealth for the wealthy um so i i think just as a framework and this is really coming very much from that paper you know we have a system that normalizes two things that are really problematic. The first is the privatization of gains and the socialization of losses. And you mentioned that many times in the paper. And, um, you know, this whole process of bailing out firms that aren't really focusing their financing activity on growth enhancing activity, it's like all we're doing is encouraging the growth of finance. So the reason it keeps growing is because we're doing these bailouts for the firms that aren't even doing the right things. And I think you do a wonderful job of focusing on things like, okay, we have these hedge funds, we have these private equity funds. Effectively since 2008, they're part of the firms that are supported by the safety net. And it's like, like why? We got to change this. <laughs> um, and and I, I really like the fact that you're pulling in all of these different aspects of um, finance there. And um, I 
I think I would also emphasize with some of your recommendations for things like uh, we need a Glass-Steagall-like separation of firms in, you know, separation between uh, commercial banking and investment banking and these different activities. You know, I think it's also worth kind of emphasizing the fact that when we talk about separation, it's not just ring fencing, where ring fencing is kind of, okay, they're going to be separate subsidiaries, right? The Glass-Steagall idea is separate them into separate companies. So there's, you know, your commercial banks that issue deposits that are actually protected by a safety net. And then there's everything else. And that has to be allowed to fail. Right. And I, I do think that that, you know, allowing the firms like your hedge funds uh, to fail is, is, is so important as um, one of the, the aspects of how we can actually get finance, you know, back into its box. It's really got to have to do with, with um, how we design the safety net and kind of reversing this huge expansion of the safety net, which I, th I think it originated when you talk about um, Euro Europe feeling like it needs its big banks to compete with the US and that kind of thing. Well, the US started expanding its safety net in the 1970s. And, and you know, that's um, kind of uh, one of the reasons US finance ended up having so much dominance is it was government backed, right? So I think Europe needs to really ask, hey, do we want to follow that path? Is it a good idea to have looked at the U.S. and say, hey, you know, this is what they're doing. We need to compete with them and then follow along so that you have this vastly expanded safety net. So I, I, I think those are really um, important points to focus on. But I think also by bringing in, you know, the fact of private equity and everything that private equity is doing wrong, it brings up this other huge problem with you know what finance is normalizing and that's anti-competitive and unethical business practices you know private equity is doing things like understaffing care homes you know they're they're harming our elderly to make profits and i mean anytime you read what they're actually doing your jaw drops because it is so unethical right and yet um you know i know the us system a little bit better competing firms are now deemed inefficient, right? <laughs> because they need more staff, because they actually believe in caring for people, right? And now that, so they've set this whole new norm where unethical behavior becomes the norm, right? And that's another, and that's also like normalizing practices like borrowing money to pay out dividends, which is really kind of like asset stripping. Um, and all of this, you know, this is coming because we have a safety net that believes that you should support the banks that are doing the leverage loans that are creating the private equity industry, right? And, and you're just kind of sitting here like the whole, the whole system it needs, needs a complete rethink in terms of how it's regulated because we've allowed it to evolve into this way where practices that really don't belong have become completely normalized. And so one thing that I think is important when we're looking at this big picture that I think, uh, you know, was uh, with all of your comprehensiveness, um, it was the, the one aspect that I think really is important to also add in. And this is coming from Katarina Pastor's work on the code of capital. And that's the issue that part of what needs to happen is legal reform, right? Um, we currently have a legal system that encourages firms, including financial firms, to choose which law the contracts they write are governed by, to choose um, through kind of shenanigans how they locate their corporate headquarters and therefore which law governs their reporting and things like that. And there's no reason they should have that much choice. Right, <laughs> you know, if, if you want to have control over the economy, you need to actually sit there and say, "Well, I don't need to recognize every other country's regulatory structure. I don't need to recognize every other country's contract law. I can say, if you want to do business here, you need to do business on my terms." And that's something that I think, really, in order to get control back of what's going on, you need to tackle the legal issues. Right, because that's just this really fundamental legal issue that I, I think has to be tackled as well. And I think the other big legal issue that is um, encouraging this 
It's just the lack of penalties for advising on tax, tax evasion, the lack of penalties for facilitating, facilitating the mis-selling of contracts and that kind of thing. Um, you know, banks that do this need to be closed down, right? We need to have real penalties. People need to go to prison. We need to say the law matters. And, and so I would just say there's a legal aspect of this that really needs to, to be brought into the picture because part of it is we're kind of allowing the legal system to not be enforced, right? And, and, and we need to kind of make sure that there are appropriate penalties for advising on tax for sale of evasion for you know facilitating money laundering and that it's got to also involve the closing down of certain firms even if they're big right and, and and so these things need to be tackled that's a reason to make firms smaller so it's easier to do it but it's really something that it, you know it's hard to figure out how we're going to get control of the situation if um, we don't um, tackle those issues um, so I think I mean yeah. I think the underlying issue that um, you're getting at, and I think Benoit brought up too, it's this issue of what's the relationship between the state and finance. And I would argue that with, when we look at our current regulatory world, we have this problem, the state's been stepping back. When what we really need to do is have it stepping in and saying, we set the rules, you guys follow the rules, you are expected to follow the rules and we're done. Right. And a lot of it is this la this willingness to say, oh, these financiers are really smart. They must be doing a good thing. And you're like, well, no, they're actually making a mess out of everything. And until we have public authorities who are willing to exert their authority and, you know, say, OK, these are the rules and we enforce them, I think it's going to be very difficult. But I you know, this report is just amazing in terms of pulling together all of those pieces. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much, Carolyn. Again, another excellent um, uh, set of points there. Um, I'm, I'm just going to uh, mention a couple of things before we get into the general discussion. First of all, I want to ask Magdalena a quick question. Um, how long shall the Q&A go on for? How much time will we have for that? Uh, we have time basically until seven. But okay. like in the last right. 10, 15 minutes, we will start taking in questions from the audience. Yeah. Where you can slowly fade from from our panel de debate to to taking in questions from the audience. You can do this flexibly. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so uh, one of the things I want to draw out from what um, Benoit and um, Caroline were saying was this issue of uh, what you might call monopoly power. Um, it came in various elements. It came in. It comes in too big to fail, um, Glass Steagall. The idea of structural separation of financial institutions, the idea of national champions as well, um, that politicians have been talking about, and that it happens all across, in, you know, far beyond finance. Also, the idea that private equity is out competing other sectors, um, other um, non-private equity firms, uh, on factors that are entirely socially uh, harmful. I'm, I'm particularly interested in those myself because I am the co-founder co of a new. Um, what we call an anti-monopoly organization called the Balanced Economy Project. And we have a newsletter and I, we have just written an article about private equity, exactly what Carolyn was talking about. And I will put it in the chat right now. Um, one second. There we go. So if anybody wants to look at that, um, uh, we are just getting going. Uh, um, another thing I would like to flag is, again, this is a, quite a British thing, but it will, it will have an impact um, over here. Uh, in Europe, I'm speaking from Berlin, even though I'm British, uh, there is a new push for what they call competitiveness in the UK now underway. Um, it was something that was all over the place before the global financial crisis. Then people realised, regulators realised that this, this push for what they call competitiveness, which is really let's support the financial sector, whether it's at the expense of the real economy or not, um, we've got to support the financial sector, help it compete. It's in sort of the international stage. Um, on this idea that more finance makes us rich. Um, and uh, so that idea after the global financial crisis kind of slunk away and people generally didn't know, didn't mention it. And it was a kind of dirty word for a few years. It came back, I think, first in the tax arena, um, the UK saying it wanted to have the most competitive tax system in the world, which you can unpack that. It's a total nonsense um, and it failed. Um, but now this year, in the last few months, we, some of us have been noticing a real resurgence of this competitiveness agenda in the UK um, and saying we can outcompete other countries. Um, 
any economist will tell you that the idea of a country competing on something like this is is is, is incoherent <laughs> nonsense, but it's also very dangerous. Um, so this is something that I, I would like to flag. This is something um, that in the UK, uh, people think it sounds great. You know, let's be competitive. Who would want to be uncompetitive? But it's actually a very, very dangerous agenda. So I think it's something worth watching um, because it does impact um, other countries. And it was one of the great drivers of the uh, global financial crisis, particularly what they call competition between um, City of London and Wall Street um, to be the biggest and the, and the, the most dangerous. So that's something that's, that's coming down. Um, and, and one element of that is, is they are wanting to water, water down this ring fencing <coughs> between um, co uh, commercial and investment banking, um, which is su supposed to be the, the the step to make banking safer. Um, although, as Carolyn said, why not just break them apart? Um, so this is this is coming, and um, I think we are also seeing another thing. You, you do see periodically after Brexit, um, German politicians, French politicians, and others saying we want to capture some of this business from London. You know. Um, we can, you know, if we get this business, we'll be better off. But this report that we're talking about here tells exactly the opposite story. This is the kind of, um, in general terms, I mean, it's a complicated picture, of course, but in general terms, the stuff, you need to be very careful what you wish for because uh, you may well get business um, that if you do capture it from the UK after Brexit, uh, may well make your own countries much worse off. Um, both in overall terms, I think one of the important things here is to understand, again, this pie metaphor, um, you are not only with too much finance, you're not only redistributing the pie in harmful ways, you are also shrinking the pie. Um, so that's kind of, um, uh, yeah, my, my uh, riff on those points. I would like to open up to some audience discussion now. Um, there is, as, as was flagged at the beginning, there are some questions um, that um, are coming in from the audience and I encourage people to, to add, some, add some more questions. I'm going to start with a question uh, from Mary, should all banks and shadow banks be forbidden? And should the collection of savings and allocation of credit be entrusted to public bodies? Um, if I could return that question to the panelists, anybody has something they'd like to say to that? I'll dive in. If, um, so I guess I've studied banking quite, uh, quite a bit. And I, I think what I would say is, that I see a role for banks and um, it's a role that completely depends on having private sector entities that are at risk of failure, right? And so basically we can think of the state um, and the central bank as supporting a banking system that then allocates credit and it's tied into the monetary system while it allocates credit. And, um, somebody kind of needs to make decisions about how to allocate the credit. And I actually, from my research, found that it's, it's good to have it tied into the monetary system for a very precise reason. And that is that um, you can use the fact that people use money to expand the money supply um, in, in a productive way when banking is done right um, so that you have lots of resources to finance good business ideas, right? And so that's something banking can do well, right? But the point is you need to have banks um, ideally holding the loans on their balance sheets. When they lose money on those loans, those banks can end up being closed down. So the banks are making the lending decisions, bearing the risk, and getting closed down when they do their lending decisions wrong. So that's why I would say, I don't actually kind of think it's a really good idea to transfer the whole thing to government because then you have the government making the lending decisions and you can have a lot of issues. It's better to have a banking system that actually makes loans, holds them on the balance sheets, and when they make bad loans, ends up losing money and or failing and closing down the banks. And, and that actually is something that can work. So I would actually say, maybe we want to keep a banking system, but a well-regulated banking system that's only populated by banks that you're ready to close down if they don't do that credit allocation job right, right? And it also is about really, we do need to close down the shadow banking activities. Like I think there's, I mean, absolutely, there's a whole range of finance that we can shut down completely and only get 
uh, growth benefits from it, which, um, but I wouldn't throw all of banking into that. That's my answer. Okay, uh, thanks. I see Magdalene has got her hand up. Would you like to add something? Yeah, I would just quickly add on the shadow banks. Uh, I agree with uh, what Caroline said uh, before and for the huge uh, shadow banking sector, I would just say what well, you should, if something does, if, if someone does an activity like a bank, it should be equally regulated. And I think this would contribute to containing the whole sector of shadow banking because it currently benefits uh, from taking excessive risks and excessive leverage. And if they were forced to, to hold more capital, et cetera, then many of those activities wouldn't be profitable. Also, ending all the implicit guarantees uh, for banks and shadow banks that always count on being being rescued when things go wrong. I mean, that encourages excessive risk taking. And I think if we can end this, we would uh, manage to uh, shrink both banks and shadow banks to a size where the activities are useful and enable economic activity, but uh, don't uh, burden society as a whole. Okay, thanks. Um, we've got uh, some excellent questions coming in. Um, I don't think we have time for all of them. So I'm just going to take a couple. Um, this is one that interests me greatly, it touches on competitiveness. Um, can the Eurozone solve these failings alone or must we convince the others before we can correct things? In other words, do you need a totally global solution or can you do something yourself? So who would like to answer that? Maybe I can quickly take that one. Um... No, you, I mean, again, it, it's an issue with the, the political system and, and globalization as well. But, but to be clear, this is, this is a key argument from the financial lobby that you, and it was, it was used with the financial transaction tax or the separation of banking activities. Like, we can't go alone. We're competing with the US. So either we do it globally, which everyone knows would never happen, or uh, we can't take any, any action. So, so I'd, I'd be quite careful. Uh, depending on the way you manage your sort of national economic system yeah i think of course you could take you could take actions because in the end what we're discussing is, is making finance more productive and increasing prosperity of, of a country so of course you can do that it, it's it's a good way to compete if you like so i think for sure you can you can you can make it happen and just this is related picking up on a point from from caroline um and some of the questions i see I mean, there's an issue of power right i mean caroline said it's there's an issue of the relationship between the state and finance and so you know, I, I agree with everything she said, but it's, I don't think it's just a question of, well, governments just need to remember they can act and force regulation on banks. The, the, first of all, uh, they finance themselves via financial markets. So financial markets hold states today, and that's related to developments that we know well. Um, so so, so that, that creates a, a, a power structure, which is the opposite that it should be, right? Um, and, the, and second of all, the, the, the massive concentration of wealth uh, with a few large corporations, with a few large individuals, again, again gives them the power and, and makes them much more powerful than most states in the world and creates all sort of influence uh, that, that, that create this situation to respond to a, another question of a, of a viewer, you know, how can, they, how can governments not act yet, saying that the report is excellent, it's, it, it, it's, it's almost shocking that, that this is not being implemented. Well, I think we have to look up to relations of powers um, and I'll finish there because I think the big question is that how do we push this agenda forward, right? Where do we find the political relays to start making this happen? And I think then we have to touch to these relationship of powers. Uh, in view. Yeah, that's a, a absolutely crucial point. I mean, I think in terms of political will, the last financial crisis, uh, it came into an ideological situation where there was kind of no alternative, as Margaret Thatcher called it, Tina, there was no alternative where um, sort of alternative voices saying this is problematic were not credible. I think now we are in a situation where uh, there are some really serious um, voices all across the political spectrum from right to left. Um, and it may take another big crisis to crystallize this. And perhaps that is the opportunity for change. So but uh, we'll see. Uh, one more, uh, I guess it's a very big question and it's kind of, it, it's two questions together. Um, First of all, what is preferable, bank-centered systems like in the EU or more capital market-based systems like in the US? A follow-on question for that, um, we have this three-part structure of banking in Germany, savings banks, cooperative banks, and private banks. Um, do you think the mostly smaller and local cooperative and savings banks are a good model for a reduced financial system? Oh, sorry, that's a rather meaty question. <laughs> Does anybody want to take that? 
<laughs> well, I can, oh, I go can ahead. start with the sorry with the second part on the free tier banking system in Germany because I think it has potential because local banks would be good position to fund the real economy, small and medium enterprises and their transition. However, we see in Germany currently that savings banks were also involved in all sorts of scandals and uh, sell derivatives that are inappropriate to the wrong clients and so on. So I think the idea is good and uh, something that is locally rooted, etc., has potential, but it, it should also be more, uh, more strictly uh, regulated so that, I mean, the German savings banks, they are public, so there should be stricter rules that they actually serve the common good. And now over to Carolyn. Yeah, I'll be happy to tackle the, the first part, um, which was about you know the bank-based finance versus market-based finance. And I guess I would add a caveat that um, when we talk about the growth of market-based finance, in a lot of ways, what we're talking about is the growth of the shadow banking system. And um, one of the things when you get into the, the, the details, of what is going on when we talk about um, market-based finance, you frequently find that there are a lot of underlying bank guarantees. Like it all kind of collapses back onto this safety net support, but in ways that are kind of hidden and that allow, um, it is this form of regulatory arbitrage. It's basically market-based finance is growing as a way to arbitrage the restrictions on, uh, placed by bank regulation. Um, so that for example, like a, a classic example of market-based finance is firms issuing commercial paper. Right. And then they can fund that instead of instead of borrowing money from banks, they can borrow on commercial paper markets. But it turns out the only reason non financial institutions were ever able to borrow on commercial paper markets is because they had a backup a bank guarantee in case they failed to pay. Right. So basically, it ends up just being an off balance sheet back bank liability rather than an on balance sheet bank liability. And that's what I mean when I say it's, it's regulatory arbitrage. And when you look at each one of these individual, you know, market based financial structures, you usually find this kind of a situation where they end up going being tied into the safety net. And that was part of what fell apart in 2008, where suddenly it became very obvious how all of this is actually a safety net. Um, to tie in. Um, so, so I kind of am skeptical of the idea that market-based finance even really exists. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to raise a question and then just go and read the report because there's some good answers in there. Um, it says, uh, what concrete pathways do you perceive for the implementation of such proposed shrink finance report re reforms in Europe, the US, or even on a global scale? So I'll knock that. We, we could discuss that now, but and, unless anybody urgently wants to say, say something, I would say go and look at the report. There's lots of good ideas in there. Does, did anybody else want to add anything to that? No. Okay. Um, so I'm going to now uh, go to a question that Carolyn has touched on, um, but I think it probably needs a little bit more explanation about the what is the reasons for the extraordinary growth of the shadow banking sector? And I think probably that there are some people on, on the call who are not, um, you know, experts in, in the shadow, shadow banking sector. So perhaps if we can have just a, sh a little explanation of what it is and why did it grow? When did it start growing? And why did, why did it grow? I think that's going to have to be our last question, I'm afraid. Do, do you want, I can say a few words. Uh, so first of all, it, it's an umbrella. Yeah? It doesn't mean much shadow banking. It's also used by the, the banking lobby to say, well, be careful if you continue regulating us too much, it'll go to shadow banking. So shadow banking doesn't really mean anything. It's, it's everything non-bank. So it, it's supposed to be banking activities performed by non-banks. Yeah? But, but actually many count the insurance sector as part of shadow banking asset management etc so including on the definition we need to to figure this out but uh, it is partially related indeed to the increased uh, scrutiny uh, over banks uh, but anyway the, i think this this needs to be studied and discussed further just just a, a few a few words caroline i don't know if you want to compliment yeah uh, yeah um, yeah, in terms of, you know, why, you know, what ends up being categorized as shadow banking, which is kind of a whole hodgepodge of things. Um, I think, you know, 
in some ways you can look at it as a response to the Basel capital requirements that basically um, in, because there were going to be capital requirements, uh, specific capital requirements imposed on certain bank activities, the banks move their activities <laughs> to things that are off balance sheet and were not subject to significant capital requirements. And then those off balance sheet activities are kind of the supporting structure, right? That is that that, that allowed shadow banking to grow. It, you know, we see it in terms of the growth of commercial paper markets. We see it in terms of the growth of the repurchase agreement market. Like all of these are things that grew mainly because they were under the radar of regulators. Um, so shadow, the growth of shadow banking is really driven essentially, I think, by regulatory arbitrage. And I think most people who study at that would, you know, would say that that's that's fairly clear. Um, I think there's another aspect of shadow banking, which is kind of your hedge fund and private equity um, world. And that's um, that that in some ways, I think, is, is, is its own story, which is probably coming more from um, uh, this, this breakdown. And I, I think of this breakdown because I come from the U.S. of, of barriers between um, uh, investment banking and, and uh, retail banking. And essentially, um, there ends up being this huge flow of funds from the banks that can create money um, and issue deposits um, into um, investment banking activities like the funding of hedge funds and like the funding of private equity firms. And they exist because there's so much bank funding flowing into them, right? So a lot of growth of shadow banking is really coming from the changing regulatory structure, I guess, of the you know, 1980s and 90s. That would be the short answer. Okay, thanks very much indeed, our panelists. I'm, I'm now gonna hand briefly back over to Magdalena just, just to say goodbye, but thank you very much for attending everybody. I think this has been a, a fascinating presentation. I think this is a really excellent report that, um, Finance Vendors is putting out, and I hope it gets um, the attention it deserves. So over to Magdalena. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Nick, um, for the for the good facilitation, and also to Carolyn and Benoit for joining the debate and reading our report. Uh, very, very uh, interesting debate. Great questions from the audience. Um, I, not now, not now, not now. Yeah, now I, I will just say, um, Thanks for, for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, thanks for all the positive feedback on the report. For all the participants, we posted uh, the links to the German and English version and more interesting documents in the chat. So read them. And if you find them inspiring, send us your, your ideas, send us your, your feedback. We are super interested. I think for us, uh, this report on the oversize and the harmful activities of the financial sector is only the starting point of our work on this and uh, it has been somewhat of a journey to get there but we're super happy to have it out um, and to have this very interesting debate uh, tonight uh, yeah so um, have a nice evening thanks for joining uh, thanks for discussing and uh, i wish you well